going to talk about, which is politics and particularly Brexit negotiations, where, my God, we could certainly do with some artificial intelligence. Um, <laughs> the problem now is not really Brussels, it's not really um, the obstreperous and devious French uh, or um, the stubborn Germans. Um, it's not even Theresa May. The problem now is a much simpler one. It is Parliament. Um, I don't believe that there is a parliamentary majority for any form of Brexit, and I think that is driving these negotiations. Um, it's most obvious immediately in the performance of the Democratic Unionist Party. Um, uh, let me not say too much about them, but they are very difficult, as you know. But within the Tory party, there are, the party is completely divided about what kind of Brexit they want, not just between Leavers and Remainers, but within... Um, leavers and indeed within Remainers. Um, and one of the oddities about this negotiation, which I've been observing since June 2016, is that far from narrowing options down as it's gone on, it seems to have widened them out. Everything is still on the table, including reversing Brexit, including leaving with, with no deal. Um, and I think that, that is, as I, as I say, a product of the fact that there isn't a clear majority in Parliament for anything. And I see this as a sort of doom loop in terms of the negotiations in Brussels, um, because what the other leaders see when they see May, as they are doing tonight, is they see somebody and they think, what's the point of giving her something if it's going to be turned down by her own parliament? I will just say two predictions about what I think is going to happen. The first is that a deal probably will be done, but it'll be done later than anybody expects. So I would say December, possibly even January, which is extremely tight given the deadline that we're supposed to leave at the end of March. And my second prediction, perhaps more controversially, is I do not believe leaving with no deal is a plausible outcome um, because I think that the damage to both sides, particularly to the UK, but not only to the UK, could be really very serious of, of leaving with no deal. And those who um, produce reassuring forecasts that that is not the case, I don't believe them. Um, so my central assumption is there will be a deal, but... Once again, Parliament could upset that because you could have a deal which is then turned down. And what will happen if that, if that happens? I, I wouldn't like to predict. It could lead to a no deal by accident rather than deliberately. That's the real danger of no deal. Um, but it could lead to almost anything else. It could lead to a general election, a new Conservative leader, um, a new people's vote, or possibly some completely alternative approach to, to Brexit. And you can sketch out different scenarios for any of these, these things happening. It makes it particularly difficult to write about this. Um, and then I'll finish with two other comments. The first is to say you're not really very interested in politics, and I don't suppose you, you like watching Prime Minister's Question Time any more than I do, um, <laughs> particularly since the two main protagonists are so bad at it. Um, <laughs> But you are quite interested in the possible effects on companies and on the economy of what's going on. And there is a big question, what on earth should, we, should you be doing about it? As I said, I don't think a no-deal Brexit is very likely, but I think it would be foolish not to have some contingency plans in case it happens. Um, and so I would say to anybody, however big or small you are, think about the possibility that there will be no deal, that there will be queues on the M20, that there may even be a situation where, at least for a time, airliners are unable to, to fly between this country and the European Union, and there could be problems in Ireland. Uh, I don't think they will happen, but I think you should, you should at least think about it and, pl and plan for it. And the second thing I'll say is, um, even if there is a deal, which is still my central assumption, and it will look a little bit like um, the much publicised Chequers deal, at least for a time, it will not be over on March the 29th, 2019. Brexit is a process and not an event. Um, and the idea that there would be an implementation period was always a joke. It's not an implementation period. It's further negotiation. And it's further negotiation that could take several years, not just 21 months, but several years. Um, so those of us who have the happy duty of writing about this have realised as this process has gone on that we've probably got a job for at least a decade. Um, <laughs> and you may detect from what I've said that I'm not a great enthusiast for Brexit, although I'd like it to work in some way. Um, I'd quite like it to be reversed, but at the moment I don't see any way of that that happening. But what I actually have come to regret most about it is that it has become the dominant issue in British politics and it's displaced everything else. Um, and there is a massive opportunity cost attached to Brexit. I happen to think 
Brexit itself is not going to solve many of the problems with this country. I even think it might be negative. But even if you don't think that, I think the idea that Brexit will solve the housing problem, the employment problem, the skills problem, the productivity problem, no, it won't do any of those things. And I think perhaps its worst feature is it, it diverts attention from doing anything about any of those things. Uh, and I think that is deeply worrying, whichever side of the argument you are on.